Even though adding substituents to produce di and polysubstituted cyclohexanes complicates the conformational picture somewhat, we can use A values to still deduce the most stable conformer of a polysubstituted cyclohexane. In this video, we're going to focus on translating line angle pictures or top down pictures of cyclohexanes into their most stable chair forms and think about how to determine both what the structure looks like in terms of axial and equatorial substituents and how to determine the most stable conformer using A values as a guide. To rigorously analyze the conformations of a given cyclohexane, we need to convert a top-down or line angle structure into a chair conformation. The most systematic approach for doing this starts with the chair skeleton, starts with a bare cyclohexane, and then involves adding substituents with the appropriate orientations based on the directional cues given by wedges and dashes in the structure. So let's see what I mean by that in the context of this molecule here. We'll start by simply drawing the cyclohexane chair skeleton using the parallel lines method. I like to draw my chairs slanting to the right, and a rightward slanting chair is going to look like this. We next add the substituents, in this case two methyl groups. Where you add the first substituent is actually not so important. The key thing to realize is that it does fix your viewpoint in drawing the remainder of the structure. Whether you draw that substituent axial or equatorial isn't so important either, as we can always flip the ring to the more stable conformer if needed. Although this is totally a matter of preference, I generally like working with the top right carbon as the place where I put the first substituent, and I like imagining that I'm looking down from above on the structure so that my orientation in seeing this view is where this eye is located above the cyclohexane chair structure on the right. This orientation means that the CH3 group is pointed away from me, which means if I'm going to choose this carbon as carbon 1, for example, there is a hydrogen pointed towards me, drawing the implicit hydrogen here can be helpful, and there's a methyl group pointed away from me. Now, from this viewpoint, the carbon with the other methyl substituent is in a clockwise relationship to carbon 1. In other words, to go from carbon 1 to carbon 2, as I've labeled them here, involves moving clockwise around this chair structure as well. So carbon 2 is here in the chair form. At this carbon, we have an axial position and an equatorial position as well. And again, based on the fact that this methyl group is wedged, pointing toward me in this viewpoint, the methyl group is at an equatorial or up position relative to my viewpoint at carbon 2 and the hydrogen is pointing down in an axial position. Had we started with the ring flipped form where we decided to put that downward pointing methyl substituent at carbon 1 in an axial position, which is totally fine from this standpoint as long as my viewpoint is here, carbon 2 would be located here and the other CH3 group would also be in an axial position. Given what we just talked about, about the difference between axial and equatorial substituents, you should avoid axial substituents completely whenever the substitution pattern allows. And this is clearly a case where we have no equatorial substituents in this conformer on the right, both methyls are axial, whereas both methyls are equatorial in the left-hand structure. And so the left-hand structure avoids axial substituents entirely, which makes it clear that the left-hand structure is the most stable conformer of this disubstituted cyclohexane. To start the second case here, we once again begin just by drawing the chair skeleton using the parallel lines method. Numbering the carbons, 1 and 2 here, we can pick really any of the six carbons to start as carbon 1, but we see that if our viewpoint is from above, like so, then carbon 2 is going to be oriented in a clockwise sense from carbon 1. In other words, carbon 2 is going to be here. The wedge on this first substituent indicates that in drawing the chair conformer, that methyl group should be pointed up towards us, and the position pointed up towards us at carbon 1 is clearly the axial position. The same is true at carbon 2. The methyl group should be pointed up towards us, but notice at carbon 2 now that the position pointed towards our eye, closer to our eye, is the equatorial position. And so at carbon 2, the, that upward pointing methyl group is at an equatorial position. The alternate chair form here has the methyl group at carbon 1 still pointing up, but now in an equatorial position, and the methyl group at carbon 2 also still pointing up, but now in an axial position. And the thing to notice here is that these two structures are equivalent in the sense that they both have one axial and one equatorial methyl substituent in a 1-2 relationship. They're not perfectly superimposable, and I'll challenge you to mentally rotate these to verify that. We'll talk more about 
the spatial relationship between these two molecules in a later lesson on stereochemistry. They're related as enantiomers. Because they're enantiomers and they both have one axial and one equatorial methyl group in a 1-2 relationship, the two molecules have equal energies, and so we can draw either chair conformer to think about the most stable conformation of this molecule. One other thing worth pointing out about these first two examples is that they differ in the relative orientations of the methyl groups. They're both 1-2 dimethyl cyclohexanes with two methyl groups attached to a cyclohexane ring. However, in the first case, one methyl is pointing away from us and one methyl is pointing towards us, and this is true both in the chair conformer and in the top-down line angle drawing, as it must be. Because the substituents find themselves, roughly speaking, on opposite sides of the plane, quote-unquote, formed by the atoms of the cyclohexane ring, we refer to them as trans, and we refer to the molecule as a whole as trans 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane. Notice in the second case, however, that both methyl groups are on the same side of the cyclohexane ring, roughly speaking. They're both pointing up towards us. Because they're both aligned on the same side of the plane, quote-unquote, formed by the cyclohexane ring, we refer to this isomer of 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane as cis. We'll see other examples of cis-trans isomerism at later points in the course, but all types of cis-trans isomerism involve groups being on the same side or opposite sides of some structural element. Rings and carbon-carbon double bonds are actually the most common contexts in which we see this. In the final example here, we have a disubstituted cyclohexane with two different substituents. So the two potential chair conformers present us with an interesting conundrum regarding which substituent should be equatorial and which substituent should be axial. We have a methyl and a methoxy substituent with oxygen bound to a CH3 group. Let's be systematic in our analysis here and start by laying down the possibilities. If I imagine the methyl bearing carbon as carbon 1, and I again take the perspective of looking down from above on the cyclohexane chair as my assumed viewpoint to, to generate this view, then the methyl group must be axial at carbon 1 since that's the upward pointing position. The methoxy bearing carbon is in a clockwise relationship to the methyl bearing carbon, and so carbon 3 is here, and the downward pointing position at carbon 3 is the equatorial position, as we can see if we draw in the axial and equatorial positions at that carbon. And so the methoxy substituent is going to be located in an equatorial position in this conformation. Moving to the other chair now, if I label this carbon as carbon 1, now the upward position at carbon 1 is an equatorial position, and so the methyl group is equatorial in the ring flipped form. Carbon 3 is again located in a clockwise relationship to carbon 1, and so now the OCH3 group, which is pointing down, pointing away from us, is occupying an axial position, as it must in the ring flipped form, right? It goes from being equatorial to axial in the ring flipped form. The question then is which is more stable? As it turns out, we can use A values to guide us here. The real difference between this conformation and this conformation is that we have an axial CH3 in the left-hand structure and an axial methoxy in the right-hand structure. The most stable conformer is the one that suffers from the weakest 1-3 diaxial and Gauche interactions, right? The weakest destabilization. In this case, if we look at the numbers, the substituent with smallest A value is methoxy. Methoxy has a smaller A value than methyl, owing largely to the fact that oxygen has lone pairs where the methyl group has hydrogens. The most stable conformer is the one in which the substituent with smallest A value is axial. Using this idea, we can conclude that the right-hand chair form is the most stable chair form of this molecule. The big lessons of these three examples include the idea that you want to be really careful in choosing your vantage point and make sure you've accounted for differences in the steric effects of the substituents if the goal is to draw the most stable chair conformation. It's important when translating Lewis structure drawings like you see here into chair conformations that you be really careful to avoid accidentally drawing the enantiomer of a given structure in certain situations. Use molecular models if necessary in order to do this. We've already hinted at this in a couple of previous examples, but I want to show you a couple of examples here where this really comes into the forefront. Molecular modeling software like JMOL can actually make this process fairly easy. JMOL has a function where you can import a molecule by its name, so we can simply type cyclohexane, and JMOL pulls in the most stable conformation of this molecule, which is, of course, the chair form. JMOL also includes a model kit mode, which allows you to add substituents to the model very easily. And so, for example, we can put this model in a position where it looks like the drawing that we're given and add substituents in the appropriate positions. So here, for example, 
the position pointing towards us on the carbon that looks like the methyl bearing carbon is this equatorial position here. And so we can simply click to add a methyl group there. We can modify the substituent to bromine and add a single bond here at carbon 3, which is in a clockwise direction along this way. And so that too is located at an equatorial position here. And we've generated the most stable chair form of this molecule. All that's left is to actually draw it. We can actually do that just by converting the given model here into the appropriate orientation to draw this chair form the right way. Drawing it is then simply a matter of translating what we see into a chair form. And the point of this is not to rely on the software necessarily as a crutch, but to use the software to help you develop visualization skills. As you add substituents to the structure and rotate it around into ideal orientations, develop the ability to do this in your mind's eye. One important point here is that the molecule shown here is not the same as the molecule in which we moved in a counterclockwise direction and put the bromine on this carbon rather than this carbon. To show this, I've pulled another methyl cyclohexane model in, and rather than moving in a clockwise direction as suggested by this structure, if we move in a counterclockwise direction, in other words, if we kind of head backwards, head back into the screen and add a bromine at this position, this molecule is not the same as the molecule on the left. The way to see this is to try to align the methyl groups. If we move this, for example, into an orientation where the methyl group is pointing out towards us and we've got the roughly speaking planar looking cyclohexane, we notice that the bromines are now on opposite sides of the molecule. This one is pointing to the left, this one is pointing to the right. These molecules are not superimposable. In fact, they're enantiomers, mirror images that are not the same. The lesson here is to be really careful how you number your carbons. If we're calling this carbon 1, carbon 3 is in a clockwise direction, the carbon bearing the bromine, not in the counterclockwise direction. Only the structure on the right here is correct. There are many ways to draw this structure based on different perspectives of the chair form, but in all of these, the carbon bromine bond is clockwise with respect to the carbon methyl bond, and they're separated by two carbons so that they're in a one-three relationship. We can apply the same idea to generate the most stable conformation in the latter case. But again, we want to take care to make sure that the hydroxyl group and the CH3 three group are arranged in a clockwise orientation like this, rather than a counterclockwise orientation, which would be associated with the enantiomer of this molecule. When we do this and take care to position both substituents in equatorial orientations, we've generated the most stable chair conformer. And the point I want to make here is that it doesn't really matter what perspective you take to draw the most stable chair conformer. They're all equally correct. They're just different perspectives. So if, like me, you don't like drawing left-leaning chairs like this, you can absolutely swing the molecule around so that it's a rightward slanting chair. Drawing the molecule from this rightward slanting perspective is just as correct as drawing the leftward slanting chair.